Good morning. Hello. This is our second day in Philadelphia. Yesterday, we went to see all of the major sites in the historical district. And today, where are we heading, Kev? We're going to Valley Forge. Right, that was the winter encampment for George Washington and the Continental Army. Visitor Center at Valley Forge. There is not a lot of people here, which is very cool. We are going to go inside and get the pamphlet that explains the auto tour we're going to do today. There were 12,000 soldiers that were camped here. It wasn't just soldiers that were here. George Washington's own wife, Martha, came here as well. They had them build huts that were made of wood, but they didn't really have very much uh, firewood around here. They cut down so many of the trees to build these log houses, but then they also used it for, uh, for firewood to try and keep warm during the winter. Continental currency, of course, you know, nobody wanted it. They only took English money. British currency. So Shillings, French money, Spanish, British currencies. French officer's pistol, that's an also. Dutch musket, French musket, French musket. Yeah, Dutch. so of course, you know, they wouldn't have had the British ones because <laughs> they were no longer British soldiers at that point. We've got the British, British swords here, the hangers, hunting swords, short sabers. More than 75 regiments of soldiers arrived at Valley Forge with an understanding of various military formations maneuvers, but practiced wildly different techniques. I believe it was Varen von Steuben who helped them to become a cohesive army, um, which is why this is called Prussia in this area. One of the biggest problems Washington faced whilst here at Valley Forge was actually receiving supplies. Congress just didn't understand how much they needed and how quickly they needed it. The fact of the matter is, whilst encamped at Valley Forge, the Continental Army lost more men to sickness than they did to the war. They actually only spent six months here at Valley Forge. However, the war would rage on until 1781 when Cornwallis officially surrendered at Yorktown. And in 1782, 100,000 British servicemen and loyalists began to flee the country. Exactly eight years into the war, George Washington on April 19th, 1783, officially declares an end to the fighting. The first stop that you come to on this tour is the Visitor's Centre and it is really important to go in there. They have the great exhibits we've just shown you uh, and you learn more of the history of who was here and how long they were here for. Now we are at two and this is General Muhlenberg's Brigade. It also has some uh, the log huts and also the readouts. This was the third year of the war. This was the third winter that the army had held. And during those times, war basically stopped. It just made it impossible to move troops. And because Philadelphia was being held by the British, George Washington chose Valley Forge as their winter encampment. So now we're going to head up here to one of the readouts. I'm not sure I'm saying that word right. It just doesn't feel it just doesn't feel like a real word to me. If you haven't watched our video from Fort Fisher, which was in North Carolina during the Civil War, then uh, you can go visit that. That had similar defensive structures just like this. That cannon you see right there 
When we were at Arlington National Cemetery, there was a marker on a gravestone that looked identical to that. I'll put a photograph up. This red out, I realize now, well, I've read that it's the French for a place of retreat. This was designed in a triangle so that each redoubt could see the other. This was designed by the French general Louis Le Bègue du Portail. Please forgive me if you're French and you're watching this because that was the worst ever. Anyhow, he designed and mapped the defensive system for the encampment at Valley Forge. And why this one and why here? This was number one and it overlooked Philadelphia, which is where the British were. There were mile-long views from here with no trees. In 1777, this view was completely open. This would have provided a critical early warning. General William Howe's British forces were cautious about the strength of the American position here, however, and they never made the one-day march to attack Valley Forge. Hello. Can you see, if this bird comes flying out of here, I'll be so upset. This oh, okay. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't want to upset him. He's uh, worried because this must be a nest. So we'll step back. I don't want to upset the wildlife. Here he comes though. All of these redoubts were connected with tunnels. So this is the way you would go in through the trenches and connect with tunnels to the other redoubts on the outer perimeter. During the time of the encampment, this ditch you see here would have actually been a moat and would have been filled with water to make it even more difficult for those nasty British to come this way. Just being here and, and knowing what happened here and so many men were lived and died right here, it's just, it's just breathtaking to see this place. Triple bunks and a fireplace in the back. 12 men in this space. Okay, so I'm standing by the fireplace here, as you can see, and Kevin is right there by the door. 12 men. Yeah, it's about 15, maybe 15 feet long and about, I don't know, 12 feet wide. Enlisted men and non-commissioned officers lived in these 12 men to a room. You can try out one of the bunks, Kev. You want to try it out? historical markers are placed throughout the park and they commemorate the Continental Army but not only that they commemorate each division and each brigadier that led those divisions the next one along the road is actually a marker in memory of the unknown soldiers buried here at Valley Forge Here in front of us is what was called the Grand Parade. It extended from where we're standing on this ridge to almost a mile away. And this was the center of camp. Now remember again, no trees. It would have been pretty much stripped and it probably would have been mud. When Baron von Steuben came and trained the troops, 10,000 Continental Army soldiers came on this ground here and demonstrated their new skills for General Washington and a crowd of dignitaries. After passing in review, extra rations for everyone. It's a gala celebration that also celebrated the allegiance with France, which definitely was a turning point in the Revolutionary War. I hang my head low like a willow tree. These dark stormy days always come and rain on me. The arch was authorized by Congress in 1910 as a tribute to George Washington and his army who endured the winter encampment at Valley Forge in 77 to 78. It was designed by Paul Philip Cret, a prominent Philadelphia architect and dedicated on June 19, 1917.
Got the presidential seal right here. And on this side, I go all the way over, you can see the symbol of national treasure, the movie. <laughs> it's one of our national the symbols. The pyramid signifies strength and longevity, and the eyes and rays represent divine providence. Right, it's one of our national symbols. You'll see these on the dollar bill. supporting our channel click on the link in the description to find our patreon page if you watched our tour of mount vernon the home of george washington one of the things i really wanted to see was the room where lafayette had stayed during his visit and it was under reconstruction and it was just a big empty room. It was very sad. Here at Valley Forge, he also had housing. It isn't open to the public where he lived, but you can walk down and that's what we're gonna do now. Was this one of the old trees cut down by the soldiers? We'll never know. Probably not, but it sounds good. And here it is. This is where the Marquis de Lafayette stayed during the encampment in the winter at Valley Forge. If you don't know who the Marquis de Lafayette was, he was an incredible young man. Came to America to fight for the revolutionaries. As just a teenager became one of George Washington's leaders of his regiments fought in many of the huge battles that were held uh, here uh, for the Revolutionary War. He did come back to the United States and visit, and when he did so, all the veterans of his brigade lined the streets in Boston and at the harbor to greet him, which made him cry. He was an incredible young man. Coming to see Valley Forge is not a new experience. It was a popular place for patriotic outings and rallies as early as the 1820s. By 1877, the centennial celebration brought 40,000 people here to camp. The first building you come to when you come down to Washington's residence is this rather imposing train station. Prior to the arrival of the Continental Army, this property was owned by Isaac Potts. George Washington, Martha Washington, and up to 25 aide-de-camps lived and worked in this building. The wooden structures that we saw earlier are obviously reproductions. So how much of this property was how it looked when George Washington, Martha Washington, and his aide-de-camps lived here? This entire section on the right is the original property. Built around 1774, it was one of the newer properties here at the time. And George Washington insisted that these properties were rented. So upon the end of winter encampment, this was returned to the family. This section was the kitchen. It used to be two stories. It is now just one story. And sadly, it's only open on Saturdays and Sundays right now, which is just so sad. Let's go around the back, see what we can see. This is where George and Martha lived, where Hamilton would have been, where John Lawrence would have been. These were the aide-de-camps. If you are a lover of Revolutionary War history, this is a huge must-see. You can appear through the windows here, and the rooms are tiny. I imagine 25 plus people lived in this building. It's lived and worked. They didn't just live here. They worked here. They wrote all of his dispatches. This is where Hamilton wrote to Congress and said, hey, we need more supplies. We need more horses. We need more of everything. 
written right here in this building. Right here is the carriage house that belongs to the dwelling of Isaac Potts. This would have been where Washington would have stored his horse and maybe the horses of his senior officers. Kind of odd to me that Lafayette was uh, so far away. I mean, he wasn't an aide-de-camp. He was actually a military leader. So although Washington was one of our greatest military leaders, he did not want to be remembered as such. So in this sculpture of him, he is not holding a sword, he is holding a walking stick. He is also standing next to a plow blade. The plinth that he's standing next to is actually 13 rods that represent the original 13 colonies. This is a copy from the original that is in the state capital at Richmond, Virginia. These huts here were the Commander-in-Chief's guards. They were the elite security force. And what's special about these guys is that today they are known as the 3rd United States Infantry and they stand guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier in Arlington. They had to be American-born. It was assumed that such men that were born in America would be loyal and have a vested interest in the success of the war. Pretty sure this was the latrine. It's full of water and then it goes out here to more water. This part of the drive is the South Inner Line Drive and it brings you onto the outskirts of the Grand Parade. To our right here is Mount Joy which actually looks out onto Mount Misery. We are on our way to the Redoubt 3. George Washington said liberty when it begins to take root is a plant of rapid growth. This statue was erected by the National German American Alliance in 1915 and it honors Major General Frederick Wilhelm Baron von Steuben. He was actually Prussian and he changed the war. If it weren't for this man right here, along with the French Navy, I don't believe they would have won the war. Not only did he train the troops behind me on the Grand Parade, but he also taught better sanitary conditions so that in future encampments, less and less soldiers died of illness and disease. It's quite fitting that the statue of Baron von Steuben should stand and overlook Grand Parade grounds. While Baron von Steuben had a huge impact on the military here and on the, the outcome of the war, you have to remember that he was a paid mercenary. He didn't come here out of the goodness of his heart. He was hired by Washington to train his troops, but he could have declined, so that was incredible. So, very, very brave man, well known for his bravery, his discipline, and also for changing the shape of the war. This here is a statue commemorating Nathaniel Green, who was the quartermaster general at Valley Forge. Here we are at Washington's Chapel, and this is a beautiful outdoor memorial. There are bronze plaques throughout the courtyard commemorating each state who bravely fought during the war. There is also one each for the Comte de Rochambeau and the Marquis de Lafayette. This monument here is to the mothers of the nation and it is so beautiful. What we needed, not what we thought we needed. Don't give up, don't give in.
This is the Alban right here, but what I find most beautiful here are these statues of soldiers within the organ. They're beautiful, aren't they? I'm just gonna pan out so you can see the actual organ itself. Oh, and they're on the ends of the pews too. Oh my goodness. You can see much clearer. What? We were inside the Memorial Tower at the George Washington Chapel at Valley Forge. Building of the tower began in 1941 and it was finally finished in 1946. This beautiful tower was erected by the daughters of the American Revolution and it not only honors the Revolutionary War heroes and veterans but also every American soldier who has been lost in every war since then. Take everything we have and let them we hope you've enjoyed our tour at Valley Forge. As you can see, we're heading out on our next adventure. Join us next week as we share our exciting adventures in New York City. Until then, we'll see you on the trail. <laughs>